Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming here today. Um, we are delighted to welcome you for Teaching the Humanities as a Survival Skill. This is the third um, event in the Futures Initiative series, The University Worth Fighting For. Um, in case there are people here who aren't familiar with the Futures Initiative yet, we are a program in our second year here at the Graduate Center. Um, our aim is to advance equity and innovation in higher education through student-centered teaching and learning and also to promote reinvestment in higher education as a public good. Um, as I mentioned, this is the third event in our year-long series, um, which uh, the series as a whole focuses on student-centered justice, uh, sorry, student, it's a series of discussions that tie student-centered, engaged pedagogical practices to institutional change, diversity, equality, and social justice. Um, each workshop that we're having here at the Graduate Center monthly is paired with a student-driven online discussion group on the same topic that's hosted at haystack.org. I want to mention the online discussion group in particular because it's a really great opportunity um, for public writing, perhaps especially for your students or if you're a grad graduate student or an undergraduate student yourself, it's a great opportunity to engage with a group of like-minded people. Um, Haystack tends to be a very supportive and thoughtful and productive discussion space. Um, and so it's, it's a place where I would really encourage you to, um, to try out some of your ideas and to connect with others around the country who are thinking about the same issues. Um, anybody can participate by creating a Haystack account. This is at hastac.org. Um, and we really encourage you to participate and to encourage your colleagues and students and friends to do the same. I want to start with just a couple of quick announcements about other upcoming events here at UC, because it seems to be a really busy event uh, moment here. And there are a lot of things that you won't want to miss. Um, tomorrow in particular. So tomorrow, um, the Center for the Humanities is hosting a day-long conference on each Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's Between Men to celebrate the 30th anniversary of its publication. Um, Kathy will be speaking um, on a panel at 2.30. And it, uh, the conference, again, goes all day. It's here at the GC in Alabash Recital Hall. Um, also tomorrow at 4 p.m., the English department is hosting a Friday forum on critical university studies, where panelists will take on the question of how graduate study in English can ensure a viable, progressive future for higher education in America. And one more tomorrow, um, Narrating America in the Contemporary Community College, um, which is happening, actually, right in this room between 9.30 and 2.30 p.m. Um, that might especially be of interest to some who are here because I know we have quite a few guests from uh, LaGuardia Community College, which I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll speak about in a moment as well. I also just want to mention that next Friday, October 30th, the Psychology Department is hosting its annual Pedagogy Day, which is open to everybody regardless of discipline, um, so that's something to check out. And finally, on November 3rd, Intellectual Publics will be hosting a lecture by Terry Smith called Picturing Planomena, Contem Contemporaneity, Difference, and Connectivity. Now, to turn to today's discussion, um, we will be talking about the value of humanities education for all students, not just humanities majors, not just graduate students, and not just students at four-year colleges. Um, it's in the context of that that we are especially excited to announce a major Mellon grant that we have uh, just been awarded in conjunction with the Teaching and Learning Center here at the Graduate Center and LaGuardia Community College. Um, the project will be called the Humanities Teaching and Learning Alliance, and it's um, an incredibly generous gift of $3.1 million funded by the Mellon Foundation to help train graduate center PhD students who are interested in teaching in the expansive human humanities, arts, and interpretive social sciences um, at community colleges. Our Haystack team at the Graduate Center is so proud to be partnering with LaGuardia Community College in this endeavor, and we're really delighted to have a uh, guest from LaGuardia here today. So we do want to take a moment to thank the Mellon Foundation, as well as um, our partners and those who have made the grant possible, some of whom are in this room. Uh, let's see, David Olin, is David here at the Provost Office? Um, David is Professor of Music and Interim Associate Provost uh, and Dean of Academic Affairs here. Luke Walzer, the Director of the New Teaching and Learning Center here at the Graduate Center. Um, Helen Coe, I'm not sure if Helen's here. Helen, hello. Um, Helen's the Director of Institutional Giving here at the GC, and the grant would not have been possible without her work. Um, two of our LaGuardia colleagues are not here today, Brett Maynard, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and Howard Walk, the Assistant Dean of, Affair, of Academic Affairs and the Director of LaGuardia Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, they are our primary partners on the grant. 
Um, since they couldn't be here, we do want to take a moment to recognize some special guests from LaGuardia who are joining us today. Um, our speakers, who I'll introduce in just a moment, uh, but also Dimitri Cap Capitanakos, uh, Dahlia Elsay, and Jade Davis. We're really delighted to have their perspectives on the discussion today. Um, and finally, one last celebratory announcement. Uh, we also have with us the geography professor, Ruthie Wilson-Gilmore, and we are just thrilled to announce that she's been awarded the first Eugene Grand Distinguished Scholar. lot of big things to celebrate. So sorry to run through so many wonderful things so quickly, but we have a lot of rich discussion ahead of us. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to our speakers. Um, convening the discussion today will be Kathy Davidson, the director of the Futures Initiative and co-director of um, the uh, Humanities Teaching and Learning Alliance. Mike Rafino was a doctoral student and one of our graduate fellows with the Futures Initiative. Um, he's in the Human Development Program, and he's a, a graduate of LaGuardia Community College. Eduardo Viana, who is a professor of psychology at LaGuardia Community College and one of our faculty fellows with the Futures Initiative, um, who will be co-teaching a course in the spring with us. Um, and Vanessa Bing, who is also a professor of psychology at LaGuardia Community College, who is joining us for the day. But thank you all so much for being here. We look forward to the discussion. I'm just going to say a few words about this incredible grant. Um, I also want to say when I was uh, first accepted um, this wonderful job at the Graduate Center, the first college that wrote to me and said, how would you like to come and, and give your inaugural talk about the Futures Initiative and about your work um, was LaGuardia Community College. And I didn't know how the Graduate Center would feel about that, so I wrote to the president and the chancellor and the provost and said, is it okay if I give my first talk at LaGuardia? And they all said, that would be fantastic. And it was the most amazing day. It was the faculty day at LaGuardia. And I first got to meet wonderful people. I'd already read um, one or two books, I think, by President Gail Mello, and I have huge admiration for her. And I'd already planned on profiling her in a book on the future of higher education. So I was already a fan of LaGuardia's. Little did I know that a year later we'd be partnering on uh, this incredible grant. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about this one. Some feet, we don't know all that's going to happen in this grant. We'll be starting to meet on November 5th and we'll be really working out a lot of the details. But some of the exciting things is 27 graduate students will be uh, on fellowships where they'll be working with master teachers at LaGuardia Community College and actually teaching at LaGuardia and learning what it means to be teaching community college students. Uh, one thing I have learned from interviews with President Mello is in some ways, and I've also been doing a lot on the history of the community college movement um, starting in the early 20th century, one thing that's different about the community college versus the uh, research universities, the community college is based on inclusion, whereas the history of the research university is based on exclusion from its very beginning. Instead of selectivity, the goal of a community college from its beginning and its mission is to ask the question, who are we excluding and how can we redefine ourselves to include them? Might that be GED students? Might that be prisoners? Might that be people who haven't had another chance? Might it be working mothers? Might it be 60-year-old people who have been suddenly superannuated in their jobs and need to come back? How can we remake education for those people who need it and who have been excluded from other methods? What I think will be a side benefit of this grant is when you rethink education from the point of inclusion, you take everything about the whole system, grades, credentialing, standardized testing, uh, motivation, credential-centered learning versus teachers and teacher-centered learning, and you turn it inside out and you have to think of the most basic assumptions of learning. We right now know that higher education in America exacerbates income inequality, racial inequality, gender disparities, rather than ameliorates them, right? The GI Bill and our whole ideology of higher education is that higher education is the pathway to the middle class. It isn't anymore except in community colleges. So I think not only will this be a wonderful way, and I think it might be the first program, we're trying to find other programs that are like this and we so far haven't been able to find it, it might be the first official program that has PhD students at a research university trained to teach community college students under the tutelage of master community college teachers. So they're actually learning how to teach community college students. 
So I think we're going to, one, train some excellent community college teachers. Two, that will be a great way of also working to ensure um, in continuing excellence of uh, the education of community college students. I also think what those graduate students have to give back to the Graduate Center in terms of helping us all as graduate professors who often do not teach um, the, the, uh, an inclusive population of students is going to be vastly um, interesting and important and profound in terms of thinking through our own assumptions um, as teachers of graduate programs. I think we all will learn from what we all learn, in other words, on every level, undergraduates, graduate students, and professors. This is really going to be an important program. The other thing that I think is extremely important is that we're looking at the humanities as what it means to be human. So this might be social sciences, interpretive sciences, science studies, the arts, all the different ways that we think about creative thinking, critical thinking, um, analysis, interpretation, reading, writing, languages. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about humanities in that big temp way and what it means. Um, there's a, such an obnoxious idea out there that community college learning should be vocational training, and vocational training is STEM. That's never told to elite students, right? That it should be just STEM, uh, narrow vocational training. And in fact, the most technological places like Google that have done data-based analyses of their own hiring and promotion practices have found over and over and over again that the fastest way to ensure somebody's failure at Google is to make sure they're only a programmer. Right? That the people that proceed, this is their own data-driven analysis, the people who succeed up the, lengths, the, the ranks at Google not only do have technical skills, but have all of those other kinds of interpretive, critical, communicative, collaborative, empath empathic. That's another one that turned out to be very high in the Google self-studies um, data analysis. Ability to communicate with other peoples across cultures. Um, which is interesting because Google's culture is not so cross-cultural. <laughs> um, uh, it certainly isn't very cross-gender either. Um, um, but, you know, so what does that enriched world of not only vocational training, but the vocation, as Amatri Sen says, the, voca the vocation of living a productive, uh, generous, responsible, creative, satisfying, uh, responsible, uh, and equitable life. And that, I think, is the bigger goal um, of this whole Mellon uh, grant. And um, inclusion, social justice, everybody learning from everybody learning, big humanities, and we all have a lot to learn. And I couldn't be more excited to be working with partners at LaGuardia Community College. And I hope I get to work with, with all of you. I know I get to work with Mike, because we work together almost um, every day. So uh, Mike, by the way, is the person who started off our reading group for this month on the humanities as a uh, 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 survival skill. So I'm now going to turn it over to. to thank you. So, uh, thank you, everybody. It's really exciting uh, to be here and uh, to hear about this grant. So we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, so we want to have like a rich discussion. So we're just going to make you know some points uh, to uh, to help frame the discussion. Talk about some of the practical work that we're also doing at, at LaGuardia. So, uh, um, Mike was my student at LaGuardia about like five years ago, and uh, it's such a pleasure that he now is here at the Graduate Center studying with Anna uh, Stetsenko, who used to be my advisor many years ago. And uh, so, I think that, <laughs> not, not so many years ago, <laughs> but I think so much in the spirit of what, you know, what this grant is about. And I think it's, it's really, I, I love what Catherine was saying, because like, I never taught a student at a community college. Uh, in whom I, I, I did not see a vast uh, potential, yes. right? And I think it's really, it, it, it really breaks my heart, you know, this vocational, narrow, right, <laughs> view that we're there just to train them uh, for jobs. So, uh, so we, we're going to have a discussion about, like, how teaching uh, the humanities, broadly defined to include the social sciences, right, can be a tool to promote diversity and equity in uh, in a community college. So just to give you some you know, context here, right? So the, the landscape in higher education is uh, changing. There's like a broad reform movement, right? In, in response to sweeping social changes impacting post-secondary education, you know, the, uh, including the dramatic uh, diversification of the student population, uncertainty of the job market. So higher education research is saying, well, we need to prepare students 
uh, for an increasingly interconnected global economy and society, and we need to expand in, uh, our understanding of learning right? to be transformative and in, uh, based on engagement in bridging learning and identity uh, development. So these are uh, just some quotes from very uh, well-known uh, scholars uh, in higher education. And this from a report that I think everybody in Rwanda has read called Learning Redefined. It says that learning must be included in a much larger context that requires considerations of what students know, who they are, what their values and behavior patterns are, and how they see themselves contributing to and, uh, and participating in the world in which they live. You know? Now, uh, I also want to, you know, uh, to frame uh, our conversation in terms of uh, new, new approaches in, uh, in education and, and development, you know, uh, including critical and dialogical pedagogy, uh, sociocultural psychology, and especially the, uh, the transformative activist stance, the approach that uh, Anna you know, has been uh, developing, I'm working uh, within that perspective, which builds on Vygotsky, Frady, and Bakhtin. Right? And I guess the central tenet uh, regarding learning is that learning becomes personally transformative by providing tools for identity development and opening up new horizons for personal and social growth. So, Especially for this knowledge uh, right, that we construct in the humanities and the social sciences, they are you know wonderful tools to help students develop a compass about their current location and the ongoing flow of transformative collaborative practices, in which they provided the tools to critically examine their history, present, and where they're going and ought to be next. Right? And that uh, so with that knowledge, students can facilitate students taking an activist stance towards creating their futures in a society that itself needs to be created, that rather than merely uh, reproduced and um, um, adapted to. Okay. So, um, so we all know that the humanities and the social science foster cultural understanding, historical perspective, critical thinking, ethical engagement, creativity, right? uh, good writing and aesthetic uh, appreciation. And so, so that really uh, can help uh, open up different social cultural horizons to students and it promotes an awareness of diversity, and it can be a powerful tool to challenge uh, ethnocentrism, right, to problematize and challenge uh, adapting to the uh, status quo, and it calls for developing a vision about what kind of society we want uh, to help to create. So the point is that we really need to, right, to give the tools for students right, to, uh, to engage broadly with the world and not learn in, uh, in a very narrow sense. So I'm going to turn now to, to Vanessa, and she's going to talk about this amazing project that she does in her urban uh, black psychology. And then we're going to hear uh, from Mike and how uh, he uh, got to be involved right, uh, in our programs. Yeah. So thank you, Eduardo. So you know, I'm a psychology professor who believes in the practice of liberatory pedagogy, uh, where education is the practice of freedom. And my work is largely informed by the, the work of feminist scholar Bell Hooks, who was also influenced greatly by Freire, um, and as well as Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist uh, monk. And for me, from day one, it is critical to, to give my students uh, their voice, to allow my students to have their voice in the classroom. Because many of them come into the classroom having had prior educational experiences, as many of you know, where they were passive learners and came to believe that they had absolutely nothing to contribute. So I tried to flip that around from day one. And then, of course, there were other students who became reticent and unwilling to speak because they were led to believe that they spoke too much, too, with too much of an accent or they spoke with non-standard English that was not acceptable in the classroom and they might be laughed at and so they, you know, that keeps them from becoming engaged in the classroom. So I am personally committed to decentering my classes where I'm not so invested in being the singular authority figure in the, in the classroom, but rather I invite my students to share their own knowledge, and expertise, which each of them are capable of bringing. So while it's certainly my job to introduce new theories, ideas for students to consider, it's even more important to help them see the connections to their prior or existing knowledge and what I'm presenting in this classroom. So Bell Hooks, you know, she encourages us scholars to, and I quote, transgress those boundaries that would confine each pupil to a rote 
assembly line approach to learning. And that's with the goal that we may respect and engage our unique beings in the classroom, the unique beings of our student and our unique beings. So she recommends that one way we do this is engaging in dialogue. And she states, to engage in dialogue is one of the simplest ways we can begin as teachers, scholars, and critical thinkers to cross boundaries. And that is, of course, what we're all trying to do. We're trying to cross these boundaries in the classroom. So what I'd like to do is share an assignment that I created uh, for this urban black psychology class, where students are required to research and create a video project that uh, looks at and examines, uh, thoughtfully examines their communities. So the, the goal of this is to have students engage in a very thoughtful reflection on where they live, to understand the similarities and differences between their communities and others. Because in time, um, in class, we spend time talking about black communities and we address some of the myths, the stereotypes, the misconceptions about black communities that are often uh, misrepresented in the media. So this exercise becomes an opportunity for students to express uh, their creativity, um, their insights into the challenges and possibilities of the communities in which they live. So let me, and hopefully this will go smoothly. So, for this particular assignment, I do give my students free reign. You know, they are given instructions, they, are, they do a little research on their communities before they get to the video portion of it, where they may look at census data, find out what the population of their, who lives in their neighborhood, what different uh, racial ethnic groups. So they're doing some work and really critically looking at what are the elements of my community. And then they're asked to create a video project where they're presenting to their, cl uh, their classmates. And I don't give them any restrictions on how they should present that video. So some students choose to narrate the video. Some cho students choose to incorporate um, music and no narration. Some combine the two. So this first. Uh, if we have time, I'll show you a little bit of a second example. But this first example is one student's presentation. It is without narration. It's completely music. And it's, um, she's looking at the neighborhood of Corona, Queens. So, 
clearly she's using this video, among other things, to contrast, you know, the difference in her community. Um, and obviously she chooses to make use of the, the gritty sounds of rap music to convey particular energy and sense and feel of her community. Um, and again, you know, this is, I, I don't put any restrictions on their, you know, what they can do, what they should say, because I want their voice to come through. Here. Um, and just show a quick minute of another student's video who chooses to narrate. Uh, one of the things I like about her video, and I don't know that we'll get to it, is she chooses to interview um, community residents, and uh, you know, which is a nice aspect of connecting with your community. My neighborhood, Crown Heights, is a very diverse community due to the ethnic diversity of its residents. Crown Heights is very well known for its annual West Indian Parade, also known as the Labor Day Parade. It is a very colorful event that indicates the big presence of Caribbean people in the area. Also, there is a big presence of Hasidic Jewish residents. This is Nostrum and Person Street. You can see it's a very busy area. Uh, a lot of people. Most of the businesses are here in Nostrum. Drug stores, a Chinese food, many nice stores, the whole thing. Along Nostrand Avenue, which is a very busy avenue, many businesses can be appreciated in the images. Most of the business owners are Caribbean residents who work and live in the community. As an example, this is Alexander, who owns a strip shop and lives in the area. He is from Haiti. He says that the neighborhood has treated him very well. So, there you get the chance to see. We're not, obviously, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you the interview. But it's, you know, certainly it adds a, a nice touch and a way of her presenting her community. And, you know, <coughs> this activity, for me anyway, conveys the importance of constructing assignments that engages the whole student, where they can enter with a sense of mastery or expertise, if you will. And it, this gives them a sense of agency, um, ownership of the assignment. I get 100% compliance, everyone does it, and they appreciate being able to bring their self into it. So it's important that we impart the message that they come in, they all come in with something, they have something to contribute, and it's our job to help you know, learn to express and refine their ideas. And I think through such an, an assignment as this, our students are able to do just that. And they truly bring their whole person to, into the classroom. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Pino. I'm very happy to be here. I'm also very delighted to be with my uh, two uh, colleagues in the Boy Community College, the two success mentors. Uh, so it's, it's almost like Thanksgiving came early. I have all my family here <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the same time from multiple different uh, levels. Uh, okay, so as, as Waro mentioned to you, I'm going to talk about my experience in the work that we created. It's called the, the Peer Activist Learning Community. And this is a group that meets uh, in the Royal Community College. And in this group, we discuss our learning, our professional and life goals, and, and our engagement in, in broad sociocultural practices. Um, in this group, we contribute to, uh, we actively contribute to the learning activities that are relevant to our own concerns and, and pursuits. So definitely uh, based on what the students uh, bring to, to, the, to this group, which the acronym for future reference is called PALC, Peer Activist Learning Community. <coughs> So the project is largely based on reading uh, critical theoretical uh, learning, and that consists of various types of, of, of knowledge, from concepts and theories to literature, poetry, and film, uh, current events in the news, as well as offering collective support uh, for course assignments. So students, and I also do this 
we could uh, this is a place where we could bring our courses to get collective support, not just from uh, Eduardo but also from our peers. So, <clears throat> as a way that we unite uh, humanities and social science knowledge, we uh, critically examine uh, our social practices and discourses that lead to inequality, poverty, racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination. And, and that includes our own assumptions and, and, and our own knowledge. So the point is to facilitate uh, our, our own positions, to let's take a stance on, on those issues, especially towards uh, learning, with the overall goal of developing activist agendas for contributing to these practices that could bring about uh, social transformation. So one of the ways that uh, PALC uh, engages uh, diversely is that we aim to negotiate uh, diverse and often divergent discourses and positions vis-a-vis -vis wide, uh, wide range of social issues. And throughout the years, this project started about five years ago, and throughout the years, we've explored a various um, content ranging from exploring the meaning of race, race ethnicity, immigration, to feminist perspectives, inequality, passivity, and alienation, especially in the classroom, and individual and collective activism. So all in all, we're um, growing a, a sense of awareness of ourselves as social, cultural, and historical agents who contribute to these social practices. Um, me, and my, me personally, um, this project was personally transformative for me, and I have here um, some posts I'd like to hi highlight of when I um, had a newfound learning identity. So based on what we were learning in this sense, the learning sociocultural psychology together with critical pedagogy and other social, uh, critical social science theories allowed me to connect those concepts to events in the world, to social practices, uh, and to my life. So phenomena that, that before appeared unrelated now seemed uh, connected through global economy and history. So it was really a space to connect uh, what we once thought was abstract academic knowledge and make that concrete and relevant to our own lives and pursuits. So essentially, in some, we became about a growing awareness of ourselves as social, cultural, and historical agents who contribute to these uh, social, cultural practices. Okay. You can go ahead. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, that concludes, um, but we'd just like to have some broad uh, discussions uh, or broad questions for these discussions, such as, how can the humanities and social science enhance student agency, especially for uh, community college students? Uh, what curricular changes might be necessary to infuse humanities and courses? And, and as you can read there, I guess we'll, we can leave this up here. And I'd also like to point out that these questions are also being uh, exchanged in our reading group online. It's on haystack.org. Uh, um, the reading group came on this Monday, so the discussion is still fresh. Uh, it's very open to people who are just jumping in and for people who are continuing in with the, in the discussion. Thank you. We have about half an hour for conver conversation and questions, and um, I just want to make one comment. This idea of taking of, of that moment where you take what's abstract and realize how it's related mm -hmm. to you, I actually think it's something that um, often in graduate education doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, or it happens for mm -hmm. students, but often doesn't happen in the world of the formal graduate education. And I think one of the things that we're hoping with this program is to make that passionately the case for graduate students, but also for graduate professors to realize how, um, you know, if you're only teaching, if you're a graduate professor only teaching with the implicit or explicit idea that you're only training people to teach future graduate professors at research universities who will teach graduate professors at research universities, you don't have to do a lot of introspection about what your purposes are. But when you have to think about what this connects to everyday life, and even, I mean, we use the word survival, but I think in some ways it is survival. Um, that makes you think really deeply about what counts in my discipline, what counts in my education, what counts, what is really, really important about this. And even as you're doing the most specialized work, I don't think it ever hurts to make that kind of um, contact 
with those foundational principles. I mean, I think that's what keeps you from being uncynical and keeps you open to change and social justice for the rest of your career and not one of those people who simply wants to perpetuate your own turf, disciplinary turf for the rest of your career. Maybe I'm being naive here, but it, the people I know who keep their, their own disciplinary and uh, intellectual excitement burning do so because they know it has power and impact in the world, in their own lives mm -hmm. and in a, in a larger world. So I think mm -hmm. what you said about your own life mm -hmm. is also true in terms of the structure of, of mm -hmm. education on every level, from the community college student. Um, and I agree so much with you and what you said, that when you look at your students, you're right. seeing these students who, yeah. I, I, I mentioned the other day that, is it called a scout? in athletics where there's like baseball scouts that go to the mm. Dominican Republic or mm. when I used to hang out a lot in, in rural Alberta mm. there'd always be hockey scouts coming mm. to rural Alberta looking mm. for people that might be great hockey players mm. and there'd be somebody who would find that person who had a spark they weren't necessarily perfectly trained but they had the spark mm. that they knew could go on to something else there's something about finding students who have that spark and being that professor who can take that spark and help it mm -hmm. to become something else mm -hmm. that can help give it the support to actually become turn into something mm -hmm. which at elite universities mm -hmm. is a given right. and is often not the case for student the mm -hmm. kind of student who finds their way to a, to a community yeah. college mm -hmm. uh, it's often even not even assumed that anyone mm -hmm. will ever be scouting them mm -hmm. And uh, you know that seems to me so crucially important for yeah. for what we all do. Yeah. And yet, there's a lot of work to be done, which you know we're doing in this grant. It's going to be a big step forward in uh, transforming the, the structures in, in higher education, especially in, in community colleges. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, th this work was uh, featured in, in the New York Times uh, last year, and it talks about you know Mike's transformation in this project. And you know, so. Uh, the idea that I had when I started uh, working on the world is that yeah, I'm a developmental psychologist and I, I could see that potential, but there's so little I could do in the classroom, just, you know, contained in the courses. And one of the things that the, the, the New York Times reporter wrote, which was in, very interesting, is that the, the thing about community college, surprisingly, is that the lack of a community. Right? Mm -hmm. So the work was really to create a community. And there's a lot of work now in terms of co-curriculars, right? Like, uh, Crossing the boundaries, the learning doesn't take place just in, in the classroom, but also changes the you know the curriculum so that it, it addresses right uh, these issues. And I and I, so that was really the the motivation for this, like you know, because uh, the structures are so fragmented. It's still, like you know, it, we uh, faculty and academic affairs we we deal with the learning, and then when students have their life issues, you know, then you refer them to student services, and then they then the learning you know is never addressed. You know, so our students, they, you know, I have so many students who have like layers of, of diagnosis and, and taking, you know, medication and they're anxious and they, they're taking pills, but that, you know, the source of the anxiety doesn't go away because you have to learn, you have to, you know, to pass the classes. That's the, usually the, you know, the big source of, you know, of that anxiety. Now, okay? and so that's what we, you know, we try to do, create a community where the students could come, talk about their, their issues and, and connect that uh, with, the, with the learning. And, uh, you know, and also at LaGuardia, and, you know, some folks here that, you know, we have a new first year uh, seminar that's trying to move, you know, in that direction. So it's giving us more room, you know, in, in our curriculums to, uh, to build this kind of uh, pedagogical uh, practice. So, yeah, we need to make more connections. And I think what also helps us is that we all, we many of us take advantage of some of the faculty development seminars. We have a wonderful gender and diversity um, seminar that speaks to some of these uh, pedagogical practices and helps us to really reflect on what it is we're doing in the classroom. Um, you know, are we using ourselves in the classroom? Are we being standoffish in the classroom? How can we, you know, create a real community in the classroom? And um, one of the LaGuardia guests, Dahlia, she's uh, one of the uh, co-leaders of this wonderful gender diversity seminar. It, it, I mean, one of the things, especially at an event like today, one of the things is the time to really um, connect with other teachers about teaching yeah. and, and, and that dynamic thing that we do in the classroom that changes every year as our population changes and how we then uh, respond. 
but it's also to make bring that sort of same reflection to the students, where the humanities is about reflection, right? And I think that's also a direct relation. You can see it in that fantastic sort of in those videos, right? Where I mean, I wonder, like, what do you do, Vanessa, after the videos? Like, what kind of video? Right? Any reflections, or how do you actually have them sort of establish that kind of same thinking that you do in the seminar and bring it to your students? Which is what sort of came to my mind when you were. Yeah, I mean, the, when they first of all, when they present these videos to their classmates, it it always is such a rich discussion and dialogue, and then students are asked to reflect on, you know, what did they discover in these presentations? What does it make them think about, you know, their own lives, their own experience, the experiences of their classmates, the communities that they come together in? And it really, you know, you can see a transformation in their thought because of the first part of the assignment, again, is having them just think about their own neighborhoods and think about their neighborhoods. Um, in relation to the world, any kind of global influences in their communities. And I think after the exercise, they are thinking much more broadly. They're seeing a lot of connections between their classmates, presentations, and what it means for them. So there's a lot of thought and reflection going on. And you can see they are certainly shifting in their thinking. And it's amazing. It's wonderful to see. And they're talking more to one another. And the class becomes that much more engaged, and they feel a greater connection to one another. And, and I guess like, uh, one thing that's really important to me is that uh, our students have a tendency, and of course I don't blame it, it's understandable, that they think that academic knowledge, the theories, it's, uh, it's disconnected, it's not really directly relevant you know, to their lives, because you know, many students, they're there just to get the degree and, and move on. Right? And, uh, and with, with this experience, I've been bringing this back into my classroom, which is not, with a psychology course, it's not so easy, because in general psychology, you know, you have topics you have to cover, perception, sensation, memory, all, you know, in, in the abstract, right, in a, in a cultural vacuum, in a historical uh, vacuum. But I, you know, and that's something that Vanessa and I, you know, we've been trying to, you know, to work on. But in my first year seminar, I just started asking my students, I, asked, I gave them an assignment. I asked them to talk about their culture. No. And there was enormous confusion. They thought, oh, what is my culture? And then for some, it was very easy. You know, I was born in Colombia, some Colombian American. And then all the students were like, well, I don't think I have a culture. And it's just like, I'm an African American, but that's just a label. And then I was like, what do you mean that's just a label? You know? And then there was this discussion. I, what does it mean to have a cultural identity or, or an ethnic identity, which is a, a topic that was so discussed in Pauk. I had a student, like, uh, he came because he was like, there was this burning thing inside. He wanted to know what it meant for him to be a uh, Latino. And if there was something for, that he should embrace or not. Uh -huh. right? and, he, and he had a friend that kind of passed as white and he was Latino, but he couldn't pass. And that was like, <laughs> I, and he was there, he, he was, and I realized like he, he, wa he wanted us to, you know, and then we're reading all these different theories and there's all this disagreement and this divergence and it's such a, you know, an incredibly uh, complex uh, topic. And, so I think that that's the thing, the connection, you know, that, that learning then becomes, you know, um, it's more than person, it's like their the, the whole lives. It's not something that you do, actually, it's really about, right, finding out who you are and, you know, right, what do you want to do in the world? How do you want to, well, how do you want to participate in this world and contribute to it? I mean, it's right, students want knowledge that's meaningful to their lives. I mean, I had an right. interesting discussion with a student yesterday, we were talking about, um, uh, some theory, uh, theory uh, presented by uh, an African-American male psychologist, um, A.J. Franklin, who used to be at the Graduate Center. Um, and he talks about men and the, this invisibility syndrome. And we were talking about the, the as one aspect of that, where male, black male students may gravitate towards the back of the, back of the classroom mm -hmm. because they don't want to be noticed. They want to fall under the radar. And after we had this very um, interesting exchange, um, one African-American male student who is always in the back of the classroom, he says, from now on, I'm moving to the front of the classroom, <laughs> you know, because I'm not going to fit a stereotype, and I, wow, I, I, I never thought of myself that way. And, you know, again, sort of making connections to their lives and to, in terms of, you know, ideas and theories that are being presented to them, and cultivating a greater um, self-understanding that's going to transform the way he is as a student. I'll bet you in every mm -hmm. class he'll sit in the front row and try to be engaged in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? No. 
we had a couple of questions come in on the Twitter stream. Oh, good. Like, fantastic. Yeah. That's all right. Um, one, uh, one person, Erin Parrish, asks, um, how do we make the time for this kind of teaching? She says, it's clear that collaborative and experiential teaching and learning are rewarding for everyone, but it can be so time consuming to teach. So how do you balance that? What do we do about that? There is no balance. <laughs> 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 try, try teaching a community college with a 27 credit. Uh, teach them all, nine horses a year. I don't know where the balance is. <laughs> you, you just go with your passion, I guess, and you know, and you, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know that I have a better answer, but I think <laughs> it really is about um, how meaningful is this for you and what you do. You know, if you just want to be that person in the front of the room, shoving information to students, then you'll, you know, you'll conduct a traditional classroom. But if you want that real, uh, rich experience, you're going to think about um, introducing innovative approaches because that's important for you, too, as, a, as an educator. You know, the class becomes enriched, enlivened, and that energizes you when you're in that space. Um, so it's a, it's a win all around, but is it... You know, where do you do it? How do you do it? I mean, if you have opportunities to participate in these kind of seminars that, um, you know, faculty development that helps you really think more about what you do in the classroom, that's, you know, that can help. I mean, one of the things with the insane 27 credit yeah. things is, I, for me, and from what some of you have uh, seen in the party, is to try to connect what you're doing in the classroom to your research so that it's an extension, right. it's not just like, burden of 27 hours or and, and then you're doing so that there, there's a more integrated approach to the way that you're teaching that connects back and which also makes it more interesting for you as a teacher. Yeah. You know, so uh, and that way it doesn't feel like these 27 credits it kind of blurs into your own. But if you want to do this on a larger scale and uh, in a more sustainable way, then we need, you know, <laughs> resources. We need to support. So, you know, like th this grant, you know, goes a long way. So, you know, we need that kind of initiative to, to support it because, it, it, yeah, it does take you know, a tremendous amount of time. And, and I was just telling you, know, I was just talking before at lunch. I feel like for, you know, uh, to teach well th these classes where they're both conceptually rich and they, you know, also engage the students. I feel like I, I'm writing a paper for, for every class. Uh, uh, that I teach, and it reminds me, like Anna likes to quote Kurt Lewin, saying that there's nothing more practical than a good theory, and I think that that's where our students begin to learn. And Anna also wrote that that needs to be complemented with saying that there's nothing more theoretical than good practice, because it just takes, you know, so much thinking right, to do this work well. So one other question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Anna was going to say yeah. something. Yeah, I just wanted to add that there, there is this unique layer there that Eduardo, Eduardo mentioned and Mike mentioned. The unique layer in this approach is the critical theoretical, critical theoretical together to really expose the abstract knowledge as utmost practical. We lose the connection of conceptual knowledge. We think Plato, Aristotle, whatever, theories are about abstract knowledge. They're not. They were tools of doing certain things, the tools of practices, and if we're able to show them, and that's the part of this approach, to expose them in their practical relevance. That's where they connect also to students' uh, lives and work. So it's about really overcoming the theory practice disconnect, which can be done. It's difficult, but it's being done. Right there. Mike, I mean, I have a question for you. I mean, what, what was the classroom experience like, the pedagogical experience as a student, sort of moving from community college to Boyer College and to the Graduate Center, from your good perspective? Question. I think that's an important sort yeah. of voice that we haven't heard quite yet. Yeah, Thank you. sure. Um, as my, in my time in LaGuardia Community College, I have heard plenty of gossip about what it's like to, to be in the classroom in a four-year university. And Students in, in community college are scared because the classes are harder. Um, but at the same time, they're also saying, oh, I, I can't wait to, to leave LaGuardia. It's a, some people refer to it as a commuter school. Like, I'm just here to get 60 credits so I could transfer to a four-year college. Um, and I, I've hel held on to those ideas. But then when I transferred to my four-year, which was Hunter College, um, I lost the, the, the close connection I had with my professors. Like, that's how I actually, and it was in LaGuardia where um, I took uh, Eduardo's general psychology course and I liked the way he taught, I liked the content, so the next semester I took his developmental uh, psychology course and that's when he invited me to, um, to Pauk. And so in, in Hunter College it was almost, perhaps it's just 
the way that institution was, but it's a city within a city. It's such a big uh, institution. It's really hard to find a connection. And, um, and I think um, perhaps also the, the student success mentors who were also transferred to other CUNY uh, schools could, it, could also uh, say something to this, but it's, yeah, it's very hard to find that community that you, that you found in uh, LaGuardia. Would you like to speak to that? Uh, sure. <laughs> Are you also graduates of LaGuardia Community College? We're graduates, yes. Ah, fantastic. So my name is Estefany. I'm a student success mentor at LaGuardia Community College. Thank you. I transferred over to uh, Peru, and I just do not feel the same connection I did as I did at LaGuardia. LaGuardia is like my, I don't know, I love the school. It's always connected. The professors are always there for you, staff. And now we have this uh, great initiative, the first year <coughs> seminar which really um, helps the first year student um, become more aware of what's going on in school, how to talk to a professor, like the very basic, basic stuff that the students at LaGuardia, uh, new students at LaGuardia wouldn't know when they come in. Obviously, because perhaps they have a different backgrounds, so whether they're uh, high school students, or um, perhaps they don't have family in their, uh, they don't have, they're the first year college students in their own family. So, uh, LaGuardia makes that connection, makes it easier for a student to transition to a four-year college. But once you hit a four-year college, it's a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. Do we have any futures initiative mentors at Baruch? No, we don't. So we try, we're starting a program of students who graduate from the classes, futures initiative classes become mentors to the next year's students. And we have them at maybe nine of the campuses, but no one at Baruch this year. But in the future, we hope to have a network of people who can help with those kinds of transitions. And we also student have uh, Mayin Hago, who's currently, you know, one of the students in, uh, in PALC. Do you want to talk a little bit about what it is like to be <laughs> why, why do you Why do you come? It's just like, way to put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes uh, maybe because I have been here I really like uh, like um, how people can come uh, like having spending uh, long your now with um, like, I don't know how to say that like um, okay like. How people like with um, with uh, learning disabilities they can overcome this up, um, up, um, the, the learning process to get um, successful in for your college. Uh, it has it is having like um, a kind of impediment like taking medicine and everything and then to overcome the to get the knowledge, um, so it's, it's kind of difficult, but um, maybe with some positive feedback, it can help to those people. Are you in your second year? I just graduated from a Guardia Community College, ah. and then I had to go to my um, Brooklyn College. Ah. Wow. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Thank you. And you're also a LaGuardia Community College graduate? Yes, yes. Um, so my name is Daniel. Um, I graduated from LaGuardia last year, 2014. Um, and I, I took a, a, a very uh, different route, I, I like to say. Um, so I graduated from LaGuardia and I transferred initially to Queens College um, to pursue computer science for a bit. Um, and the, the change, I guess, in the community. Um, so Queens College was a much larger campus, I like to say. But I, I say a different path. Um, I did feel a sense of community when I was there. Um, and I'm not sure if this would <coughs> translate or correlate to other four-year institutions. But for Queens, I did feel a sense of community, at least within my major. Um, and then I really didn't like computer science too much. So <laughs> I, I, I left to uh, City Tech um, to pursue radiology technology oh, as a oh. technician. Um, and this is my first semester there, so I don't really feel the community yet. 
Um, but I'm going to give them some time and <laughs> <laughs> see what happens. Um, but uh, maybe I've been fortunate and blessed enough to really experience the sense of community at, at every stage that I've gone through. Um, and it's unfortunate that other students don't feel this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's definitely the problem here. Yeah. I mean, we know there's so much research on this, the challenges of community for commuter students. Mm -hmm. right. You know, at residential colleges, the graduation rate, especially at residential colleges mm -hmm. where students don't have to work oh. full time. I mean, a typical CUNY student works more than a full time job. It's about <laughs> 1.3 full time jobs. And when you're a commuter student on top of that, it's just hard to stay in school, and community is difficult. But I think all of these things, like PALC, um, through the Futures Initiative, we've been trying to use online communities to help oh, people yes. stay connected mm -hmm. because of the way people live all over the city, and it takes so long and it's so difficult to stay connected. And part of what the Mellon Grant is going to do, too, is allow for an online community so people at least can stay in touch and check in on one another. Hey, we haven't seen you at PALC in a while, and what's going on, and how are things going? We know you transferred to City College or to to Baruch and how are things going there and you know so there's a way that we can keep mm -hmm. in touch with people because I think that makes mm -hmm. such a difference and we know it does right for motivation and for longevity and for, re for uh, resilience if, if you have other humans invested in what you're doing and uh, it's harder when you're in, at a community it's harder in all life situations when you're detached from other people when you're detached from community so that's a re you know it's an obstacle to be confined. And so to create, yeah, yeah. you said that, you no, know, a community so, college yeah. doesn't have a community. You've created right. a community. Right. It's really and, important. And that's so important. We didn't emphasize that enough, but, you know, like the, with these online tools, it really, you know, that's one of the most obvious ways that we can really benefit from them, from, you know, creating communities, making communities more and more dynamic. And that's exactly, so, you know, like now that Mike is in the future initiative, he's learning, you know, about all these tools, bringing it to Pauk, and now mm -hmm. we communicate almost like 24-7 and every, you know, so, and there's, and I think people feel that there's a there's a network. There's somebody there for you if you you know if you need something, and that makes you know a huge uh, difference. Right. I mean, it's it's by no means a substitute, but sometimes I see this. I mean, no. it sounds dorky, yeah. but I see it on Facebook. Somebody says yeah. my cat died, and 20 people will then be saying I'm really people who don't right. even know them. I'm so sorry, and it does yeah. make a difference. Yeah. You know, it really does. It it feels different, and I think I think especially in learning situations, it can make a difference. An hour is going by really quickly, but there's one more question from the Twitter stream that I think might be a nice way to Thank conclude. You. Um, Rachel Ortega wants to know, what advice would you give to a PhD student who wants to teach in a two-year college? How could they best prepare during their studies now? Apply for a program. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you say? I was asking Mike if you wanted to take that one up. So, uh, you, as you're preparing you know, to teach. Oh, okay. Um, I guess I would, I, I guess I would suggest um, to know, I guess, the community within the, the college, but also the community around the, uh, around the college as well. Um, and I think a, th a theme has been touched upon that I think that will be great for when you, mm -hmm. when professors are teaching at the two year is to, um, yeah, to have a, a, I guess, develop gradually, you know, student-centered pedagogy where you bring where you're allowing students to bring their knowledge into the classroom and to see that they have uh, you know as Eduardo was saying the, the chance to make a contribution and have unlimited potential to, to do that mm -hmm. Could I, uh, this has been fantastic yes. thank you all and I just I want to say something it, I found it a little odd that our colleagues from LaGuardia have been called guests I, we we're all faculty and mm -hmm. students at one great university mm -hmm. that serves more than a half a million people a year. And that's why I work here. It's a thrill. It's a huge thrill. So mm -hmm. brothers and sisters and others. One other observation I wanted to make. I'm so excited, especially Eduardo, when you made that yes. um, you out you highlighted the unnecessary distinction and then sometimes debilitating distinction between what happens in the classroom and something called student services. Right. With all due respect for everybody who works in student services, it's a really hard job. Yes. But 
that division yes. has in so many ways taken the place of the actual difficult work of diversity and inclusion in the classroom yes. at all levels of yes. diversity. Absolutely. And so what I see all of mm -hmm. us in this project bringing together, not only theory and practice, mm -hmm. but service and, and yeah. learning, exactly. um, and also the, you know, the huge question of what uh, graduate education is for. Yes. In the American Studies Association, Kathy was once president, I was once president, we had huge discussions about the fact that many of us train mm -hmm. PhDs mm -hmm. and we get this pressure from upstairs, wherever upstairs is, <laughs> yes. Yes. to send them off into R1 jobs, as Kathy was saying, and that's an absurdity. To me, the nobility of this profession is to teach as many people and make the mission of changing the world our collective mission. So thank you so, so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, well, I think, unfortunately, we're out of time, but um, the conversation can continue online. We have been tweeting at the hashtag Pride for EDU. Many of you have been doing it as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Google Doc where we've recorded notes from today's session, as well as questions that have come in both here um, and online, so um, if you have additional questions or, or comments that occur to you later on, feel free to chime in there. And do check out the online discussion group that Mike has going um, on HATESAC. It's a really terrific way to participate in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of great readings that are posted there, um, people from all different types of institutions um, all, all around the country who are participating in that conversation. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Our next workshop in the series will take place on November 18th. Um, it'll be focused on career paths and labor practices in the academy, so we hope you all join us for that as well. So thank you again to our panelists, and thank you all for being here.